Okay, Anna, Kari, and Micah, if you're joining us, um, this is chapter nine, sorry, chapter four, Resurrection and Rebellion, and we're going to complete the Taiping Rebellion section, okay? Uh, you can try, but I don't know if it'll work. Okay, so here is chap- chapter um, four, Taiping Rebellion, and I'll be pausing this so we can talk a little bit. You guys should also have your map available for this as well. Um, Here we go. Okay, so what two groups were at war in China? Number one? Poor and rich. The poor and the rich. And what dynasty did the emperor of China currently belong to? Qing. He belonged to the Qing dynasty, which is actually spelled Q-I-N-G. Okay. The early Qing rulers wanted to be just and wise. One of the first Qing emperors had even written out rules that should govern the life of every virtuous man and had done his best to follow those rules himself. But as time went on, the Qing emperors had grown less virtuous. By 1850, the royal court was filled with luxury, waste, and corruption. Government officials had begun to take advantage of the poor and to use tax money to make themselves rich. Meanwhile, China was growing. Between the year 1700 and the year 1850, the population of China doubled from 150 million to 300 million people. By 1850, all of those extra people were moving away from the crowded cities of China towards the more distant farmland in the north and west. Soon, groups of newcomers to the far areas of China began to quarrel and fight with the people who already lived there. Government officials in these distant parts of China sometimes treated the newcomers harshly, taxing them, driving them away. Okay, so the dynasty was not just and virtuous. It had become corrupt and unjust. That was question number three. Question four, what had happened to the population of China between 1700 and 1850? It doubled. It doubled. Said you're not going to be messing around with your paper. You're going to be actually writing stuff down, right? Okay, it had doubled. Okay. So the China in the outline down there, China faced three problems. We've only heard two so far. What were they? Um, The population doubled. The population was growing too fast or it had doubled. Um, The The Qing government was corrupt and unjust. And we have not been given the third reason yet. Okay. Um, But I did want to show you before that. Um, the map here, and I'm going to show this to the girls as well. I know it may come up backwards. I'm not sure, but this big country in the middle, can you label that China? Okay. So that's China. The big country in the middle is China. Um, and over here are Isaac, you have got to stop doing that, please. It's please. Okay. Over here, there's a, um, Okay, here is Nanjing. So there's two dots, I believe, on your map. Is that right? Or are there three? So, uh, it looks like three. Three. Okay, it looks like there's three. Um, I don't have anything for that top dot, so I'm not sure what that is. But these bottom two dots right here, not the top one up here, 
the top, the, the, the two dots here, the top, the one to the left kind of is Nanjing. N-A-N-J-I-N-G, okay? And the one underneath that is Shanghai, S-H-A-N-G-H-A-I. All right, so that's there. And then if you're looking at your map, um, can I, can you turn yours, Isaac, so I can see what they're seeing here like this? Um, you guys know over here, this is Japan. So why don't you go ahead and label that? That's Japan. Okay. Um, above China right there. Actually, Isaac, that's not Russia. It's technically Mongolia. Yeah, they have the long tube, so, that's so there's Mongolia. Right here on the top middle is Mongolia. Off to the side, this one that kind of sticks around here is Manchuria. M A N C H U R I A. Korea is this one right here. Up here. And then this is Russia in the top corner there. Okay, so let me hold that up a little bit. It's a really big one for the side. Um, like India or something. No, over here? Good, yeah. I I don't know. I'm not sure. I think that is China now, isn't it? Or not? Now it is, I think. So maybe it's I I'm not sure. This right here, if you if you put lines through that area right there, this area right in here is the taping area of control that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, so we'll come back to our map, but let's go on to the third problem that China was facing. And China was growing poorer and poorer. British merchants had brought the drug opium to Chinese ports. Opium eaters had beautiful dreams, but they couldn't stop taking opium. Millions of Chinese became addicted. Chinese opium users gave British merchants tremendous amounts of money for opium. But the British didn't spend nearly as much of their money on Chinese goods. So more money was leaving China than was coming into it. The country was becoming poorer. Chinese workers could find no work and often no food and taxes were rising. Okay, so the third problem for China is too much money is being spent on opium. And up on the top, question five, why did the growth, we should have done that first, cause problems in China Chinese people, when as they're growing, right, they're moving away from the cities towards the north and west, and they began to quarrel with the people that already live there. Did we talk about that already? Yeah. yeah, we said that. Groups of newcomers to the far areas of China began to quarrel and fight with people who already live there. So honestly, it's sort of similar to what's happening in America. I mean, in the sense that we're getting all these people that are coming from the west. Imagine if they come here and tell us that we shouldn't be farmers and that we shouldn't have pigs and that we shouldn't have whatever. We'd be kind of frustrated, right? Because we've already lived here. This is where we live. All right. Number six, why was more money leaving China than coming into it? Yeah. So why was more money leaving China than was coming into it, Isaac? Because of opium. Opium. So Chinese were spending more on opium than the British were spending on Chinese goods. So more money's leaving and less money's coming in. The poor people of China were desperate, hungry, they were ready to follow anyone who would promise them a better life. The leader who arose was named Hong Shui Quan. Hong came from Shui Xiang, far south of China's two great rivers. He had studied for a long time to take the examination that would allow him to become a government official. As a matter of fact, he studied so hard and so long that he collapsed in exhaustion. While he was unconscious, he had an odd dream. He dreamed that an elderly man with white hair gave him a special sword and ordered him to fight against demons, and that an older brother joined him to fight at his side. When he woke from his dream, Hong was sure that God had spoken to him in his dream. Hong had learned a little bit about Christianity from Western missionaries in his hometown, so he decided that the elderly man in his dream was God the Father, that the older brother was Jesus Christ and that Hong himself was the younger Chinese brother of Jesus, called to fight against the evils that made the poor people of China miserable. Okay, so what dream did he have? He, 
he dreamed an old man gave him to a, a sword to fight demons. And there was an older brother. So we got an old man, a son, and then he believes he's the third son. And he believed that this was God the Father and Jesus Christ. And he was the younger Chinese brother of Jesus. Which is question, what is that? Nine. Nine. Wait, what? Wait, how can, how can it be a younger brother? What do you mean? How can it be the younger brother of Jesus? Well, it's a dream. And he thinks that's what he is. That's question nine, right? Mm -hmm. How did... How yeah, did that was number eight. That was eight? Yeah, because what dream did he have was number seven. What, who did... Hong okay, right. But nine is he was the younger Chinese brother of Jesus. Okay. Wow. It's thunder. Hong began to tell his friends of his new call. He began to collect a following around him. Soon he had over 2,000 disciples, poor farmers, mine workers, charcoal burners, ex-soldiers, and peasants. Here they go, they question 10. The God worshippers. God worshippers. Agreed not to use opium or alcohol and put all of their belongings into a common treasury. By 1850, the God worshippers had grown to a group of almost 20,000 people. This huge gathering of peasants made the wealthy landowners in the area very nervous. So the landowners joined with soldiers from the Qing dynasty and attacked the God worshippers. Hong decided that this attack on his followers simply proved that he was indeed fighting against evil. He announced that he would now call himself the Heavenly King, and that his followers were citizens of the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace. In Chinese, the Taiping Tianguo. Okay, so... Um, what does it say? Does it what did Hong rename himself? The Heavenly King. Heavenly King. What's his followers renamed? His followers were renamed the Taipings, which is T A I P I N G S. They have it not spelled. Like I don't know the Taiping Twangos or whatever. Or the citizens of the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace. That was another one, okay? Oh, All right. Well, he renamed himself the Heavenly King? Yes. Yes. Hong's followers, now called the Taipings, fought back against their attackers successfully. As a matter of fact, they captured a little walled city called Yangan, a little to the west of Hong's hometown. They made Yangan their military headquarters, organized themselves into a regular army with commanders and soldiers, and got ready for war. Hong told his followers, Men and women officers must all grasp the sword. Together, rouse your courage. Together, slay demons. Golden bricks and golden houses await you. Even the lowest shall wear silks and satins. These were wonderful promises for poor peasants to hear. Inspired by Hong's words, the Taipings began to march north towards Nanjing, a large Chinese city far to the north. Okay, so they were marching toward Nanjing, N-A-N, J-I-N-G in the north. They planned to fight against the corrupt Chang officials and destroy the government that stole from the poor. To show that they were enemies of the Chang, they grew their hair long instead of wearing the traditional queue or pigtail of the Chang. They grew their hair long. People who saw them pass called them the long-haired rebels. Probably no one thought that this odd little army would amount to anything. But something amazing happened. It took the Taipings a little less than a year to march into Nanjing. And in that year, over one million Chinese peasants joined them. As they marched, the growing army of the Taipings attacked and killed unjust landlords and greedy government officials. They burned tax papers and destroyed government offices. Every time they entered a rich house, wrote one man who saw the Taipings with his own eyes. They dug into it to find treasure, but they did not take from the peasants. Instead, they gave clothes and other goods that they had taken from the rich to the poor. Okay, so in the outline 2, A, B, and C, the Taiping army did three things as it marched north. What did it do? Um, Steal from the rich. Okay, that's one. Isaac? 
steal from the rich and give to the poor. Is that two? Either one. Any of them. No, that's one thing. Steal to the rich, give to the poor. Okay. Um, they got a bunch of peasants to join. They what? Got a bunch of, like, a million peasants to join. Well, that is true. Yeah, they did get peasants to join. But the things they did, they killed the landlords and government officials that were unjust. They burned tax paper, payers, papers and destroyed offices. And they stole from the rich and gave to the poor. It was the second one. Burned tax papers and destroyed offices. Okay. Um, if you didn't, if you missed that, how did they show their hatred of the Qing? They grew their hair long. How many peasants joined the tapings on their march? Over a million peasants joined it. And now we're going to get to the next question. What happened when they reached Nanjing? Now the Taipings were no longer a little rebel group. They were revolutionaries. They had great ideas as to how China should be run once the Qing were overthrown. They planned to divide the land up evenly, with men and women getting equal shares. Each family would grow crops and keep as much as they needed for themselves. They would put the rest into a public store. In this new country, all men and women would be brothers and sisters. Later, what? one Taiping leader would even suggest that China hold elections for its leaders like Western countries. When the Taipings reached Nanjing, they conquered it and made it their capital. Then they sent out an army to attack Beijing, where the Qing Emperor lived. They weren't able to capture Beijing, but the Qing soldiers who poured out to meet them weren't able to retake Nanjing either. The two forces simply went on fighting for years. Okay, so what happened when the Taipings reached Nanjing? Oh, they took it over. They conquered it and made it their capital. Were they able to defeat the Qing Emperor at Beijing? No. No. They went on fighting for years. Um, um, in, in three, on the outline, three A and B, the revolutionaries had radical ideas about how China should be run. They said that A, the land would be divided evenly, crops, crops, crops would be shared and that all Chinese people would be equal. So this is more like what? Like a, um, a socialist mm -hmm. government, right? Just kind of what you have. It's a more of a, actually it's a dictatorship today, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's where we are right now. Oh, the second one. The land would be di divided even evenly, crop shared. The second one is all Chinese people would be equal. Okay. By 1860, the Taipings were marching towards Shanghai. For a little while, it seemed that this city too might fall to the rebels. But then, the war began to turn against them. Great Britain had signed a treaty with China that would open up more Chinese ports to the British merchants, just as soon as the rebellion was put down. So the British began to help the Qing fight back against the Taipings. British steamships helped to move Qing armies up and down the coast. Some British soldiers even joined with the Qing in battle. By 1864, the Taiping Rebellion was doomed. Nanjing was captured as the Qing army flooded into the city. Hong Zhu Quan killed himself. As many as 30 million Chinese had died during the Taiping Rebellion. But once the revolt was over, the advisors who surrounded the Qing emperor did make some changes. The Chinese government would now help peasants who had to move to new areas by giving them tools and seeds and helping them to build irrigation systems. Taxes were lowered. Corrupt officials were removed from power. The Qing dynasty had barely survived the rebellion. But thanks to these reforms, the Qing would sit on the Chinese throne just a little bit longer. Okay, so... At the end of the chapter? That's the end of the chapter. But what did it say anything about so, the defeating the Taipings? Who joined the Qing Empire and soldier emperor and soldiers against the Taipings? The story of the, the British. Okay, 
Yeah. The British joined the Qing side. What changes took place after the Taipings were defeated? Okay, that last question, if you want to, you can really answer it in the outline. Okay, so what changes took place? Okay, wait, but it says the British helped defeat the Taipings in two ways. We didn't do that. Okay, they, um, their steamshipped, steamships helped move the armies and the soldiers fought with the Qing. Which of course is Q I N G, but after the rebellion, empire. Yep, and then um, after the rebellion empire, after the rebellion ended, the Qing emperor made changes. He gave tools and seeds to peasants. He helped build irrigation systems. So he gave tools and seeds to peasants, helped build irrigation systems. What did he lower? Taxes. Taxes. And what did he remove? Uh, corrupt government. Corrupt officials. Okay, and I think we covered the map already, but you do have a little bit of homework now for chapter four. So I gave you guys a, um, a thing that I want you to read and answer the questions about. Okay, so there's a thing to read, and then there's some questions that I want you to answer and turn in. So that's your homework for a grade. So you read it yourself and you answer the questions on that last section. And I'm gonna send this to Anna and Kari. Um, do you guys wanna read Live Like a Jesus Freak just on this video or sure. do it separately? Sure. Let's just read um, our last part of Live Like a Jesus Freak. This is the chapter, what chapter were we on? Chapter eight, we were just had the second part to do. I'm actually gonna end that and send it separately, I think guys.